So hello, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks Trevor also for, for joining for this open neuromorphic uh, talk uh, about Nango and hands-on session. Uh, my name is uh, Gregor Lenz. And um, before we jump into the session, I just want to say a couple of words. So thanks, first of all, to Politecnico di Torino for giving, providing the webinar license. That's very kind of them that we can record and host this uh, talk. Um, just want to say a couple of words uh, um, about open neuromorphic for those who, who don't know it. Um, so this is really is a very new organization. I think we started some one or one month ago, something like that. Um, so it's just created by open source enthusiasts. Most of us have not met in person yet. Um, we just started to contribute to each other's projects. And um, then we felt like we would like to kind of like uh, start this um, collaboration together as well. We see it as like an, a platform for open source code, for open hardware, for your projects as a knowledge base. And what's important is that uh, this is this spans across academia and and also um, and labs and um, and industry. And um, yeah, I think Trevor is also one of these uh, longtime contributors that uh, is very has a very active GitHub profile. Um, so we have a, a Discord server. If you're not on, on there, if you wanna, if you feel like this resonates with you, then uh, please uh, please do join us. Um, um, there's some 200 people already joined, um, signed up there. So there we like discuss papers, uh, different frameworks. Um, maybe Trevor will also do us the favor answering some questions about an angle there. And um, all of the stuff like that we do is, is you can find it on our, uh, our website, open-neuromorphic.org. Um, we also write like blog posts together and like um, one particular thing that I want to draw your attention to is that we have scheduled some more talks. So um, uh, we try to keep the frequency roughly every two weeks. Um, so after this one, the next one is uh, 14th of February about uh, a new paper that came out about the forward forward alternative to backpropagation for SNNs. Um, and uh, as you can see, yeah, it's, it's a mixture of academia, academic and, uh, and uh, industry uh, presenters. If you think that you have something that you would like to you know, share with the world, please also don't hesitate to get in touch. And um, yeah, and so that was a few words that I wanted to say about open neuromorphic. And we can come to, to our to today's presenter, Trevor Becolet. Thanks a lot for joining. Welcome. Um, just a few words uh, on this uh, um, presentation. So first of all, this session is being recorded, and we'll be we'll put it up on YouTube afterwards. Um, you will find the link on our website. And uh, a second thing that I want to say is that this is supposed to be an interactive session. So if um, if you have questions. Um, the, in like if you write them down in the q and a, I will relay them to to Trevor. Um, alternatively, I can also basically hand you the mic, so to speak, and the, you can unmute yourself and, and ask yourself. So Trevor, hello, welcome. Hey. yeah, How for sure. Uh, happy to be interrupted kind of at any time to uh, answer any questions. Uh, I think you might have to stop sharing your screen so I can. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Hopefully, we can all can we all see the screen at this point? Yep. Okay, great. So thanks a lot, uh, Gregor and Fabrizio, for the for the invite. I'm excited to talk to you guys today about uh, the Nengo neural simulator, which has been kind of a pet project of mine for. A decade. <laughs> uh, currently, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Applied Brain Research, ABR. Got a new logo at the top left, but you'll mostly see this older logo uh, in these slides. And yeah, uh, so I'll just get into it. Um, so this is maybe one of the harder questions to answer, uh, which is basically what is Nengo? I always think of it basically as a neural simulator. Um, so as you know, most people in this uh, kind of group 
people interested in neuromorphics will know um, neural simulators essentially are uh, simulating spike in neural networks. So that's what I think of Nango as, is it's uh, simulating spike in neural networks. You know, we have many different neural models, including the leaky negrate and fire. We have learning rules like STDP. Um, but in actuality, um, the way that Nango has been used uh, over the past 10 years, maybe 20 years, is um, also kind of as a machine learning platform. So we have uh, lots of demos and projects that have used Nango uh, without using spiking neurons, using kind of traditional, as they say, deep neural networks, you know, non-spiking neural models, learning with bad propagation, that kind of thing. Uh, Nango's also been, been used as a way to interface with different types of neuromorphic hardware. Uh, so we'll talk about that later in this uh, presentation, but we have a kind of a Loihi backend, Spinnaker backend, a bunch of different backends. So as a way to kind of quickly get um, access to certain pieces of hardware, Nango is a, a tool for that. It's also been used as a way to control different types of simulation environments like Mujoco, AirSim. It's been used to simulate, or sorry, to um, actually drive physical robot arms. And kind of the, the driving motivation behind Nango and like kind of the reason I think that it's been used in all these different ways is because uh, the goal of Nango um, is to use ne neural networks to perform intelligent functions efficiently. Um, and I say that mostly to differentiate it from more kind of research focused tools that are looking to emulate kind of directly um, copy or simulate biological behavior. Um, the goal of Nango, kind of the reason that we made it was so that we could actually get neural networks to do things and then having those simulations that do things, we can then later on go back and kind of uh, inspect them with the same types of, types of tools that we do with experimental uh, neural networks brains uh, to see how they match and how they don't match. Uh, so I'd like to kind of start off these kinds of talks, basically just giving you a quick kind of bird's eye view of the kind of cool things that we've done with Nengo to, to give you a sense that um, this is a kind of a large um, commercially used uh, piece of software. So the first uh, demo that I'll show here is a, uh, a project that we did with Intel to drive a simulated robot arm uh, with Luihi, which is a piece of neuromorphic hardware. Um, and yeah, this is a, a Mujoko simulation um, that is happening in real time. So on the left is that simulation being driven by a traditional CPU. And on the right is that same simulation being driven by Luihi. Uh, there's lots of details that I'm glossing over here, but you know, this is an, an adaptive network driving this arm such that it's got this weight on it that it hasn't experienced before and it's trying to adapt to that weight to reach these targets that are showing up in these uh, red spheres. And yeah, the highlight is that it does it and it does it very efficiently and quickly because of the neuromorphic hardware. We've also controlled uh, physical robots. So basically it's using the same infrastructure this, uh, the same Jacko arm, Canova Jacko arm, um, we've used Nango to actually drive that arm. Um, this is kind of a, the end of a series of demos, but in, in this case, what we're doing is where we have a vision system that is seeing this uh, Santa Claus that uh, Chris is holding. And the goal of the, the arm is to reach to it with the tip of the tool um, so the tool being an unknown weight and the tip of it being kind of an unknown offset are both things that the network has to, has to deal with. It hasn't experienced this tool before. Um, so it's able to uh, overcome those, those, uh, those uh, issues using our adaptive learning um, algorithms and is able to reach to those, to the, uh, to the Santa Claus. Um, another control example, the last control example, is um, a project that we did for um, looking at uh, windmill inspection. So 
using kind of very similar ideas and techniques, we uh, are driving a drone in a simulated air sim environment. And the idea here is to kind of do a sweep of, of this windmill looking for defects. So again, we have kind of a motor system uh, doing the actual patrol and a vision system looking at it. Um, you can see at the top right here, we have Nango doing all this work for us. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why this is important to, to do with neuromorphic hardware is that it gives us the opportunity to actually put this on a physical drone because we don't need, you know, these new neuromorphic systems are low power. So it means that we can actually fit it on a drone, actually carry it with a battery. Um, and that is something that we have done since this project was to uh, put it on a physical drone. Moving kind of more traditional machine learning, um, this was kind of a demonstration of one of the tools that we created to, which I'll talk about later, to take traditional neural network, deep neural networks and convert them to spiking neural networks. So this is a, a Nango network that is doing image classification on ImageNet. Uh, and as you can see from all these kind of spike rasters, we're doing this with spikes. And the last kind of demo that I'll highlight here is, is another project with uh, Intel's The Weehee, where we're doing keyword spotting. And this is all being done live through our kind of Nango GUI environment. Um, the, uh, if you had audio for this, you'd hear someone saying Aloha. And when it hears Aloha, it will accept it. You can see with this decision. And if it hear, hears something else, then it will not accept it. You can see kind of as um, audio is coming in, these uh, spiking, spiking neuron layers are processing that information and making a decision based on it. And just as a kind of demonstration that this is all being done, you know, this, these aren't kind of, some of those demos are sped up, but in general, this is all being done kind of in the way that it looks like. There's not really any tricks behind the hood there. This is a kind of a simple dynamics demo where we're doing a Lorenz tractor network in the Nango GUI. And it's very performant as we're actually throttling it down to one time speed here because uh, Otherwise, it looks ridiculous. Um, okay, so hopefully that kind of gave you a sense of the types of things that we've been able to use Nango um, to do since we have developed it. Uh, so now I want to kind of take a step back and talk about how we got to this point and then uh, what um, tools Nango currently offers. So going way back, back to 2003, uh, when I was just starting my undergrad degree, um, the first thing that could kind of be considered something Ningo-like was a tool called NESIM, produced by uh, Chris Eliasmith, who is the head of the C Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at the University of Waterloo, and now is the uh, co-CEO of Applied Brain Research. So although he, he won't show up much on the rest of these slides, he's basically overseen everything that, that I'll be talking about today. Uh, but in his uh, PhD, he uh, wrote a book with uh, Charles H. Anderson called uh, Neural Engineering, which gave a framework for basically developing functional spiking neural networks, um, which we'll talk about later in this talk. So he created this uh, MATLAB program called NESIM, still available on the MathWorks file exchange if you want to check that out. Um, and one of his, uh, his first PhD student, Brian Tripp, uh, kind of built on that later on made another uh, MATLAB tool called NEMO that also brings the neural engineering framework to MATLAB. Um, for those of you that have you know, used MATLAB, you know there's a lot of uh, shortcomings for it. So in 2007, in response to some of those shortcomings, uh, Brian Tripp rewrote, kind of uh, started from scratch and developed a, a Java version of NESIM, a tool for simulating spiking neural networks using the neural engineering framework. It was originally called uh, NEO, which stands for Neural Engineering Objects. And uh, later, I don't actually know the reason, but they uh, switched it to uh, Nango, 
a bit of a shorter, easier to say name, I suppose. So Brian did the initial Java implementation. Shu Wu was a, an undergrad student who wrote the, the, the GUI, the graphical part of this, uh, this tool. And Terry Stewart, who was involved in both of those things, also kind of developed a Python scripting layer using Jython, which uh, basically the second that he created that interface, it became kind of like the only interface that anyone ever used because writing the Java code directly was uh, a little bit cumbersome compared to what you can do with uh, Python scripting. So when I joined Chris Eismith's lab at the University of Waterloo uh, in 2009, we were still using this Java tool. Uh, we were developing some very large networks. We were trying to run things on GPUs. We were trying to run things on uh, Spinnaker. There were lots of things that were kind of happening that we wanted to do that was difficult to do with the Java tool. So in 2013, I um, led the development of a Python version of Nango, which is basically the version that when you say Nango, I think most people think of and is basically everything that I'm going to talk about in the rest of this talk is uh, based on this Python version. Um, so myself and a postdoc at the time, James Bergstra, um, we again started from scratch, kind of took the API that the Jython layer had and uh, improved on it, I think, uh, and developed uh, what, we'll, what we called Nango 2.0. Um, Eric Hunsberger was also very uh, instrumental in that process. And, um, you know, at this point, I just kind of want to highlight that uh, I'm going to show some faces on these slides. But at this point, Nango has been developed on by so many different people. And uh, you know, I'm very thankful for everyone that's contributed to the project um, and who's supported the project in various ways. And yeah, what I'm talking about, you know, today would not be possible without every one of those people. So kind of in order to get to uh, to show you how those kind of interesting high-level demos came to be, um, I want to talk a little bit about how the uh, this new Python version of Nengo was architected such that we could extend it in ways that we couldn't before. And uh, the main things that you need to know about the architecture of Nengo are kind of encapsulated in six main objects. Uh, five of which we call the front end of Nango, ensembles, nodes, connections, probes, and networks. And then one main object called the simulator is what we call the back end of it. Um, the builder and model are things I'll talk about because they're not, you know, core parts of the architecture, but they've ended up being very helpful. So I'll talk about them. Um, but it's the strict separation between the front end and back end that's made Nango a tool that we've been able to build on since creating it in 2013. Um, you know, the front end is, is where people are actually creating models saying, I want this many neurons that are connected in this way. Um, and the back end is what takes that front end description of a model and generates the data structures that it needs to run that on whatever hardware you want to run it on. And the strict separation between the front end and back end is why we can take all this work that we've done to create interesting models on the front end, and then with uh, not no effort, but minimal effort, run it on something like Nango, uh, something like Luigi, even though when we originally designed those uh, networks, it wasn't with the intention for them to be on the, on the Luigi uh, hardware. So, just kind of a brief description of these, these objects. Uh, and these are all Python objects. So again, nothing too special about them. And I you know, will reiterate again that if anything I'm saying here uh, wants, if anyone wants any clarification about this kind of stuff, yeah, feel free to uh, uh, write a comment and Gregor can, uh, can interrupt me and I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, so the ensemble is a population of neurons. Um, every neural simulator has got to have some way of representing neurons and the ensemble is ours. Uh, this is the icon that it looks, uh, what it looks like when you use the uh, Nango GUI. Uh, and yeah, the, the core things about neurons, uh, an ensemble is you need to know how many neurons are in there, what type they are. Nango includes um, a bunch of types built in like lifts or 
10H neurons, which you can make into spiking neurons with various things like the Poisson spiking class. And uh, if you did have something like a noise process that you wanted to inject, you would do that here. Uh, I'll talk later on about what this dimensions property uh, argument is. Um, if you're doing something that does not use the neural engineering framework, then you could ignore that. Um, and yeah, we have some kind of in-progress work to make the uh, neural engineering framework more optional, uh, but I'll talk about that later on as well. But uh, yeah, this the ensemble I would say is a pretty straightforward encapsulation of uh, population neurons. Um, nodes are kind of where um, I think Nango has, like th this is kind of the reason why Nango has been able to do a lot of what it does, uh, because a node is essentially a part of the simulation that just runs an arbitrary Python function. This is like not something that was easy to do in previous versions of Nango. Um, and, you know, when you say being able to run an arbitrary Python function, it seems like uh, you can kind of do anything. And that's because you actually can. And like, it's been kind of surprising to me that uh, people have been able to do as much with nodes as they have been able to do. Uh, but in any case, kind of the typical use cases of a node is to provide uh, input to a neural uh, simulation, non-neural inputs, uh, run functions that you, know, you don't want to implement with a neural network, route signals between different parts of your model. So if you had you know, a vision model and a motor model that you wanted to link up, there's a good chance that a node would be involved there. And yeah, when you are connecting to external processes on your computer or devices connected to your computer, you do that through a, new, through a node. Um, the only argument that's required is uh, the output. And things that you can optionally specify are the size in and size out of that output, which is the dimensionality of the NumPy array. So, you know, the, the simplest node is one that just outputs a, con a constant value and you can just pass in a list or a NumPy array to be that constant value. You can have functions of time. So like all other neural simulators, time is a kind of core central thing of, of how Nango operates. It's not like a tensor flow where you have to uh, handle time yourself. Nango handles time. But uh, you can have functions of time. So you just pass in a function that accepts t, which is your float time. And you can return a function of that. Uh, you can also take in inputs from other parts of the model. Um, you always have to take in time in case you need it, but you don't actually have to use it. So you can have a function like this that takes in a two-dimensional value and just multiplies it together, returns as the output. And one thing that happens a lot in these networks that you might not think is that important, but uh, turns out to be is uh, pass-through nodes. So these are nodes that basically do nothing, but they shuttle data from one part of the network to another. And um, to use those, you pass none as your uh, node output. And when you do that, you have to specify the size of the input that you're expecting, which is why we expose those size in and size out attributes. In other cases like these, we do our best to do it automatically. So if you don't specify it, we'll run your function to see what it outputs. Um, the next main object in our front end is the connection. So, you know, like it says on the on the label here, it's connecting two objects together. So we need to know the pre and post, the two objects that you're connecting together. These are, you know, unidire unidirectional connections. If you wanted to have a bidirectional connection, you would just make two separate connections. Um, it accepts a synapse argument where the synapse does some kind of filtering of the signal coming from the pre and going to the post. Mm -hmm. The thing that we often do in spiking neural networks is to use low pass synapses. So basically um, what that will do is kind of take your input spike train and smooth it out a bit so that the current going to the downstream neurons is um, you know, kind of a summed version of those fil filtered spikes. You can also have a non synapse, which basically uh, is is basically like a pass through node. It just like copies the signal from one object to the other. You can also specify transforms across connections. So in this example here, we're connecting a node to the first two neurons on this ensemble. And we're going to use a transform of one minus one. So you're getting 
that signal being sent to the first neuron and then the, the negative of that to the second neuron. You can also do sparse connections through passing in a sparse transform. If you want to build convolutional neural networks, we have a convolution transform that handles all that stuff. Um, and we, we also have kind of a short form. If you are using a low pass synapse, you can just pass in a float and we'll automatically call low pass on that. Um, the last, or no, the, yeah. So probe is another front end object that's important because it uh, basically is a way of marking what parts of the simulation you want to gather data from. So you pass it in a target object that you want to gather data from. You tell it what part of that object you want to get. Um, the attributes that you can probe depend on the target, and each target has a probable attribute that you can query to see what is uh, to see what um, what can be probed. Um, there's a sample every argument that defines the the rate at which you're you're sampling that probe, which is super important for things like weights because their weights can be super big. So if you're going to sample it on every time step, if you're sampling it every millisecond of a 10 second simulation, then you are going to over you're going to flow out of your memory pretty quickly. And just like the uh, the connection, you can have a synapse across a probe. Um, to get a filtered version of the uh, of the uh, thing that you're probing. So, yeah. The last object on the front end is the network. And the network is just basically a simple container for all of these other front end objects, including other networks. And it's basically a way to organize your model to uh, compartmentalize parts to say, you know, these ensembles are dedicated to doing vision processing. These ensembles are dedicated to doing some other part of the network. Um, just a way of, of grouping things. It's also a way of um, providing uh, providing kind of pre-built models to other people. So you can write a function that just returns a network that does something interesting and then make that function available to someone either by, you know, putting it on PyPI or just giving them the file. And then that's something that they can use in their simulations as well. And that's another big part of how we've kind of grown the Nango ecosystem. Uh, the syntax for doing this is kind of an interesting Python thing, which is we use context managers so that if you are inside the context of a network, so you say with that network, then anything that you create inside that with block, like if you create ensembles, connections, nodes, those are uh, going to be stored within that network. Sorry, Trevor, can I just uh, stop the thing? Yeah, for sure. For a sec. I think that there was someone who tried to uh, unmute themselves, but uh, I'm not sure if they still want to ask a question. Uh, I'm not sure what's the best way to do it, but if, if attendees can uh, react with by raising the hands, for example, then I can unmute themselves. Uh, given that we are not that many people, like uh, I'm happy to, you know, just like uh, unmute you and then you can just uh, uh, ask, answer the question yourself. Uh, ask the question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to answer a question if. There is one. Shall I move on? Maybe, maybe, yeah, you can continue for the moment, maybe. Thank you. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that those five make up the uh oh. Ah uh, yeah. So the question I'm just reading from the chat here is does Nego have pre-chain models uh, like TensorFlow? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. So uh, uh, Basically, the, the latter half of the talk, I'll be um, talking about some of the tools that we have, the networks that we have available. Um, so unlike something like TensorFlow, a lot of Nango models don't require training in the traditional um, like TensorFlow sense, where you're providing a bunch of input and output examples. Um, and you'll see why in the, the next part of this talk. But uh, 
for networks that do require a, a bunch of input output examples, we do have some pre-trained weights that uh, you can use to run some of these models. Um, yeah, and these are basically all things that we have available on uh, various projects on GitHub and things like that. Um, there'll be a bunch of links in the in, that you can check out throughout the talk. Um, but yeah, so I'll move on to the back end. So the only object that is uh, that a, a back end needs to implement is the simulator. And this is just an interface for running a simulation, collecting the data from that simulation. Um, if you were to just pip install Nango, what you get is a, a repository, a project called Nango Core, which contains those five front end objects and what we call the reference backend. And the reference backend just uses uh, NumPy. So it's a very low, there, there aren't very many dependencies that you need installed to run a Nango network. So when you're constructing the simulator, all that you need to pass in is the network. Um, optionally, you can specify a particular uh, DT, the time step of the simulation, which by default is one millisecond. All of the times that in Nango are seconds. Uh, you can also pass in a seed. I guess this, the seed should be an integer, but uh, you pass in a seed that uh, sets the seed for any random um, things that have to happen when you build the, the simulation. Uh, and again, the syntax uses context managers to make sure that if their simulator has to free any resources after it's constructed, um, it does that. I, of course, you can use it without a, simula uh, a context manager if you want, but the typical uh, way to do it is you say with Nango simulator, run your simulation. Once it's run, you can then use the data inside that simulation with this data attribute. Um, it's dictionary-like, so you can index into it with a probe, and it will return to you a NumPy array of the data that was probed. Uh, T-range gives you the actual um, time steps that were run by the simulation. It's kind of a convenience thing because, you know, plotting the output of a simulation is something that basically every example, everything we do needs to do. So uh, the T-range helps with that. Um, so. The way that that simulator works in general is dependent on the type of hardware platform that you're working with. But uh, what we did for the reference simulator has ended up being kind of helpful for other simulators. So what the reference simulator does is it generates a collection of signals and operations, operators from the network, signals being data, basically NumPy arrays in the reference backend, and operations being things that you do to that data and operations have tags such that you can, such that we can order the operations, the operators, so that everything happens in the right order, so that you're not overwriting data that you need in a in a downstream step. Uh, and the way that this looks, and again, you know, this is kind of just a peek under the hood, um, is we have this builder class where all of the build functions are registered, uh, and we do it this way so that. If you wanted to, in your model, you could override the builders that the reference builder uses. But in any case, what it looks like is you would register your builder to build a particular Nango object. Um, and that's a decorator on a function. That function takes in this model object, which is where the signals and ops are stored. And then your build function is basically generating those signals and ops, doing whatever you need to do to set up the uh, the operations that your that your network needs on your particular uh, piece of hardware. So, like I said, this is uh, we've architected things in this way so that we can generate a bunch of things, or, or rather, users and people that are creating models can do a bunch of things without having to ask us as the Nango developers to to do things. So, if people want to develop frameworks and algorithms just build interesting networks, they can do that just by creating their own uh, Python scripts that create networks. Um, hardware developers can get access, be able to run all these Nango models just by creating a simulator. They don't have to create their own front end. They can, they can use an existing Nango model and just write the build process such that um, 
such that any Nago model is now accessible to their hardware. Um, and yeah, depending on the complexity of, of the hardware, sometimes this is really easy to write a backend because you can literally just kind of like implement your own signal and ops inside your backend. And then in other cases, it's more, much more difficult. Like we're, like for Loihi, um, there's a bunch of custom stuff that we have to do to uh, interact with that device. Can, um, can I ask you a question? Oh, just to yeah, for sure. To ask a question myself. Um, so, how do you deal with uh, different implementations of, you know, let's say, let's take the simple lift neuron, click integrate and fire neuron. Um, if this is like uh, implemented different differently on different hardware. Um, like, uh, how do you how do you deal with let's say the the proliferation of um, neural models and what, what's what's available on the different hardware? Yeah, so the way that we essentially deal with that is um, we kind of have a distinction between things that are kind of compatible with the reference backend, things that we kind of expect to be you know, two floating point precision rounding errors, the same with the reference simulator and another simulator. So we have like an OpenCL backend and a Nango DL, which uses TensorFlow. These backends are ones that we expect to match a reference Nango simulation exactly or almost exactly. And then there are backends which we, you know, make no claims about how accurately this is going to match a reference Nango simulation. But uh, basically, say that you know we're going to use what the hardware implements and we think that there's a reasonable path forward for matching the qualitative behavior even if the quantitative kind of exact spikes coming of your model are different um, and a lot of the ways that we handle that are with uh, the frameworks and algorithms on the front end side cool. thank you um, Another question in the chat here is whether Nango can help for on-chip training. So if you're actually, if you're dealing with a, a piece of neuromorphic hardware, um, whether or not you can access the learning rules or the, the, the learning procedures on that chip depends on the back end, basically. So as an example, um, the, uh, Nango, the reference Nango, Nango simulator deals with um, a few unsupervised learning rules and, an, and a supervised learning rule called PES, P-E-S. Um, and just like with the neuron models, as Gregor was talking about, you know, we don't expect that learning rule to necessarily be supported by every piece of hardware. Um, you know, all of these abstractions are, are leaky in the sense that, uh, oh, I'm lagging here. I think we can still hear you, but okay. <laughs> your screen is, uh, yeah, your camera is yeah. frozen. Okay, yeah, my camera's frozen. I'll just try to restart that. Um, yeah, in any case, the, uh, you know, if, if the chip has a learning rule um, that you want to access and it's not part of the Nango front end, then what I would expect is that the back end would expose that learning rule as a front end object and then implement it on the back end. And so then you might have a situation where there is where there's an on-chip learning rule that uh, works in you know, a particular back end, but it doesn't work necessarily in the reference simulator unless we choose to implement it. Um, is, hopefully um, that... there's, there's another question. Do you include FPGAs in as a back end? Yeah, we do have a Nango FPGA back end. It's kind of a a specific project that wasn't really designed to be a generally a general purpose like take your, your Nango network and put it on an FPGA. It was um, basically a way of offloading some of the learning, which tends to be some of the more expensive parts of a simulation to offload it to an FPGA. Um, so we have the Nango FPGA project that works on uh, DE1 boards and pink boards. But uh, there is some research and also some a few like commercial endeavors to try to um, make kind of all of Nango accessible on an FPGA. But uh, yeah, I will say they're, they're not done yet. Do you think, uh, I can currently not see your camera. I don't know if other participants can, but is it uh, is there an issue with webcam or something like that? Or? 
Yeah. yeah. I've tried stopping and starting. Uh, perhaps I'll leave and come back. Is that yeah? Make sense? If, if you yeah, may, I think that would be nice to okay. also have your video if you don't. Alrighty, mind. what could go wrong? I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so in the meanwhile, if you want to type more questions, I mean, obviously, there's a bunch that I have certainly. Hey. There you go. Perfect. I'll screen share again. Okay. Um, I'll proceed. I think uh, hopefully I've answered the questions uh, to some satisfaction. <laughs> yeah, I think there's one more. Uh, basically, which uh, which hardware backends do you actually uh, support? Uh, maybe you're going to come to that. But uh, one is a question about. Do you support GPU, CPU, and TPU? Yep. Uh, so I will come to that later on the talk. But the short answer is that, yeah, we support general purpose, CPU, GPU. Um, there's a Luigi backend, a Spinnaker backend. There was at one point a Braindrop backend, but I'm not sure the status of that. Um, but you know, the ones that are kind of most important, I would say, are the CPU and GPU, which I'll talk about later on. Okay. Cool, thank you. Um, sorry? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, so like I say, on the, on the front end is where we're able to like incorporate frameworks and algorithms into this. Uh, one thing that I've sort of uh, talked about or you've kind of seen on some slides but I haven't talked about in length is uh, this neural engineering framework. Um, and uh, it is kind of a core component of Nango. So even though, even if you're planning not to use uh, the neural engineering framework in your models, if you're doing something kind of a straight deep learning model, uh, it's still kind of useful to know a few terms about the neural engineering framework. Uh, but if you are interested in kind of building functional spiking neural networks, then I would say the neural engineering framework is uh, the best way that we have seen to do that. Um, so it's based on three principles. The first principle called representation is that um, the idea here is that a population of neurons represents a vector of numbers. So the reason why the ensemble requires a dimensions attribute is because that's the dimensionality of that vector. So you have you know, n neurons in your population in your ensemble and those neurons are responsible for representing d dimensions of information. Um, the radius tells you the range that you expect those values to, to lie between. So the default typical range is one. So you expect numbers to fall between minus one and one. Then there's a few other things that you can specify, encoders, inter intercepts, max rates. I'll uh, talk about those by way of example to show you what this looks like in the Ningo GUI. So uh, the Ningo GUI has a bunch of built-in examples. So if you were to install and load up the GUI, you click on this file icon at the top left, there's a bunch of built-in examples. I'm going to go to this many neurons example in the tutorial section. And what we have here is a node, a stim node that is set up to just output zero. But in the GUI, we have this slider control so we can change the number that's coming out of it. We have an ensemble of 20 neurons that's representing a one-dimensional signal. Um, you can see when we play this simulation, you know, you can change the stimulus. You can see the ensemble doing its best to represent that, that value with those 20 neurons. The way that it does it under the hood, I won't go into many details because there's a book for that. Um, but if you right-click on that ensemble, go to details, the way it works is, um, we look at what are called the response curves and the tuning curves of that neuron. So the response curves are the direct, like if you inject current in these arbitrary units, what is the firing rate of that neuron expected to be? And you see kind of the typical lift tuning curve here. Tuning curves are, um, instead of being the raw input current, it's the input value, 
which for a one dimensional signal is the, is the, uh, the value scaled by some gain and then offset by some bias and then transformed by the encoder of a neuron. So the encoder kind of specifies um, how, what part of the input space that neuron is sensitive to. So in this case, because it's a one dimensional signal, you can only either be sensitive, like more sensitive to negative numbers or more sensitive to positive numbers. But by doing that, we get a good spread across the range of values that we expect to occur. And so essentially what we do in, in Nango during the build process is we say, you know, take a bunch of points on this X axis, you know, possible inputs that we could get. What are the firing rates from all of the neurons that we, that we would get from doing that at steady state? So if you're to run it for however long, what's the firing rate of that neuron? And then solve an optimization problem such that um, given the firing rates, you can recover back the uh, X input value. So it's a kind of a simple ordinary least squares problem. Um, and then you do that across a bunch of different inputs and you get what are called uh, the, these decoding weights. And so what Nengo is doing here on the front on, on the, in the GUI is taking all of these 20 neuron spiking values, filtering them by the filter across the connection, and then multiplying them by those decoder weights in order to get back a kind of spiky prediction of what that original input signal was, that input vector was. And so, you know, you could spend hours just playing with sliders and stuff in the interface if you want to. I'll leave that open for the next thing. I will say that if, if you don't particularly care about the NEF, um, there was a proposal that we made in 2019 <laughs> to kind of sequester the NEF parts of Nango out into their own into their own spaces and make it easier to use Nango for kind of typical machine learning networks. Uh, but we have not got around to that. But I'll move on to principle two, uh, which is transformation. The idea here is that if you're able to decode out the input signal X, you can also decode out nonlinear transformations of that input signal X. And then given the decoding weights that come from that, you can trans Trans, uh, you can transmit that information, that transformed information from one neural population to another, um, either in a low dimensional space by decoding to a vector and then encoding that vector into the next population. Or if you're concerned about biological plausibility and you wanna do kind of low level learning rules or something else, uh, some pieces of neuromorphic hardware require full, you know, N by M connection matrices. If you want to do that, you can actually multiply the decoders by the encoders and get a full connection weight matrix like you would uh, kind of manually specify if you didn't have something like the neural engineering framework. So what happens, the, the way that this is implemented in Nango is across a connection and also in some senses across a probe, when you make a connection, you can pass in a function which takes in a function that uh, given the X coming out of your pre, how are you going to transform that to your post? So if you have a two-dimensional input X, you can do the product of that to make a one-dimensional output. Um, and then Nango will do the work during the build process of figuring out the connection weights, the decoders and the encoder, sorry, the decoders, the encoders are all randomly assigned, but the decoding weights that will, um, that will transmit that transformed value to the next population. Um, you can, play around with, with different solvers. If um, I would say this is kind of more of a, a research uh, function, but in some cases, the default L2 least squares solver isn't what you want. So you can swap that out. You can also um, give either how many evaluation points that you want to do, how many X values that you're gonna, gonna check, or you can give an explicit list of evaluation points. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because if you do that, then you can also specify as your function instead of a function, just give it your outputs. So do kind of a supervised learning problem where given all of these X evaluation points, here are the Y's that I expect. And then Nango will do
do what it can to uh, compute that function. Um, so as an example of that, I'll load up the multiplication tutorial, which is number nine. And we have a very sim similar uh, setup here. We've got two nodes as our stimuli, um, just two numbers. Then a third population here, C, that is a two-dimensional population that's taking in one of those values as its first dimension and one of those values as its second. It has to be done this way because the, uh, the product requires, you know, it's a nonlinear transformation of both of those values. So you couldn't do it across separate connections. Um, and then out, out of that C population, we're, we're computing the product of those two. So when we run it, if we keep this one at zero, then no matter what we do to our A, our first multiple canned, the D, our output never changes. Well, it changes a little bit because these are all approximations and we're doing what we can with uh, spiking neurons. But uh, if we then switch B to B1, then it basically does its best to you know, do that multiplication, pass it through, change it to 0.5, you know, it's multiplying. Is there a clarification here? So this yes. GUI, is it rendered from your code? S say that again? The, this GUI, like the, the graphical mm -hmm. user interface, is, is it rendered from your code? Or is this, how do you yeah. connect the two things? Yeah, so as you, you can basically write your model in this pane, this is like a code editor. And then as you change it, so if I was just to get rid of the uh, connection between A, the stimulus and A, then we'll live update this, this as nice. best we can. It's a very difficult UI problem, UX problem. But uh, basically, yeah, you can, you can change this live. When you make a change, the next time you go to run it, it will rebuild it because you've made a change. The stimulus is now no longer connected. But then uh, you can change it back, have that connection back in, rerun it, and it works as before. Nice. The way that you uh, generate plots and things like this is um, the actual uh, objects in the network get rendered automatically. And then to create one of these plots, you right click on one of them and it gives you a choice of different things you can add. So you can add that slider. If you wanted to see the actual value coming out of that slider, you can just do that. It gives you a simple, you know, the node output. Any other questions about uh, these two kind of short examples? I know it's a lot, <laughs> a lot in a short span of time, but uh, you know, I, I hope you'll uh, give Nango a download and uh, try playing around with sliders on your own. Uh, but I'll move on to the third and final principle of the NEF, which is dynamics. And so this principle basically says you can take one of those vectors inside of ensemble, treat it as the state in a control theory system and implement nonlinear dynamical systems by uh, connecting certain parts of the model recurrently. So if you're a control systems person, a dynamical systems person, then uh, you can use all of your math <laughs> pretty straightforwardly with uh, the NEF and with Nango. Um, for some of the more straightforward things, uh, things that don't really require a control theory background, background which I don't have, I'll show you um, two simple networks that use recurrent connections to implement some interesting functions. So this is, we call the memory network, but essentially all it is is um, this B ensemble connected back to itself with a somewhat long time constant on the low pass filter and then the input value um, being transmitted uh, with a scaled down so that it's essentially doing integration over time. So as I send in a stimulus, um, the A value is constant and then the B value is integrating that constant A. So as you kind of bring it down, you can see the B trending down over time bring it back up, you can stop it when you get to the top and it should, if it's, you know, 
done the uh, optimization problem well, then it should keep its value up here kind of indefinitely <laughs> if it falls into a good uh, sweet spot. So that's one kind of simple dynamics example. Another one that I will show is the is an oscillator. So this is the same idea. We have a, an ensemble here, x, that's connected back to itself. The uh, main difference here is that the function across that connection is, uh, and this is a two-dimensional ensemble, I should say. The function across this connection now is quite a bit more complicated, where we're sending the value in one dimension to the other dimension, and vice versa, to implement a cyclic oscillator. So when you start off, you don't actually need to give it a little kick, although you could. It just uses kind of the random spiking behavior of neurons to get itself out of its uh, the fixed point at zero. But then once it gets kind of kicked out, then it uh, just starts oscillating around in a circle in the uh, decoded space. Although, you know, if you were to look at the, the firing pattern of these neurons, you can also kind of see some oscillatory behavior, but you know, the way that these are connected is not through manually specifying connection weights, it's by solving this optimization problem. Okay. Any questions on that? That's um, kind of what you need to know about the NEF to uh, understand Mango. Oh. I think we have a couple. Uh, here's okay. one, a long one. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, yeah, just read uh, it out. yeah, Eduardo says, I, sh should I read it out? Or is, yeah, go ahead. So, is this field divided in a part which investigates it from the hardware view, such as analog electronics, for example? Does there exist a subfield of the research in hardware which is investigating the potential of quantum hardware? For developing neuromorphic hardware? Um, is there such a thing as quantum neuromorphic computing? Yeah. Um, so I'm also, yeah, I'm not a, an expert, or I don't have that much um, experience with the hardware side. But the short answer is that most of these subfields do exist. Um, so for sure, using analog hardware is something that uh, Nengo has been used to do. Um, so that's definitely a thing like the brain drop backend that that was a piece of hardware that used uh, analog neurons. Um, as far as quantum computing, quantum hardware is concerned, um, not really aware of any actual attempts at making kind of quantum neuromorphic hardware. Not to say that there aren't any, I'm just not aware of any. One of the kind of more interesting um, pieces of hardware that I have heard about and um, seen some research from is on optical devices, so devices that use light to do computation. Um, and those have uh, kind of interacted a bit with um, with Nango. Okay, nice, thank you. Cool. So in kind of the remainder of our time, I just want to give a sense of the kind of tools that exist in the Nango ecosystem. So basically, if there's a part of this that kind of was interesting to you, I'm hoping to give you some pointers to what projects you might want to look into and do a bit more research on. Most of them have either kind of associated papers, associated research, or at the very least have a bunch of tutorials and examples that you can run through. Um, so on the front end, thinking about uh, parts of the ecosystem that, that kind of deal with these main five front-end objects. Um, Nengo Core itself, when you download it, comes with a few networks. Um, I won't show these examples, but uh, one of them is called the Ensemble Array. So the idea here is that if you have a very high dimensional ensemble, some things like solving for decoder, decoder weights become computationally intensive and sometimes too computationally intensive. And in a lot of cases, you don't actually have interactions between all the dimensions in an ensemble. So the ensemble array splits that up so that you can represent a very high dimensional vector with multiple uh, lower dimensional sub-ensembles um, and still have ways to compute functions off of those. 
Um, the product network is interesting because it's essentially what I just showed in that multiplication example. It's just a, a network that multiplies, well, it can, it can do any element-wise product to equally sized vectors. Um, the interesting thing about, about the product network is that it's based on a bunch of uh, research that was done by several people in the lab, but especially Jan Gossman, who, uh, you know, basically if you do this naive implementation, you try to do, um, you try to calculate the product across this space, you know, some, some parts of the space are represented more than others. And when you do a bunch of analysis, you know, you can see that, you know, you don't do a perfect job of, of multiplication, even in the ideal case of a, a very simple neural model. And it's because all the error kind of accumulates at these polar coordinates. And so what you can do is you can orient the encoders towards those polar elements so that, um, you have more neurons attuned to the part of the space that the product tends to fall into. And when you do that, you can get a much more accurate computation of the product, of the element-wise product in a, with uh, neural networks. And I, I highlight this mostly because I think it's an interesting example of how different neuromorphic computing is to traditional computing. Of course, the way that you calculate a product maybe on a very low level transistor level, you know, has some choices and interesting things you can do on there. But if you're just programming a computer, you don't really think about how a product is, is computed. Um, but when you're developing a, neur uh, a neural network, especially a spiking neural network to do something like an element-wise product, you do have to do some interesting investigations into how to do that the best way possible. Um, there's more networks that you can see in our documentation there. Um, so take a look at that if you have a chance. Um, one project that came out um, kind of around when we were developing Nango in the first place in 2013, or developing Nango 2 rather, um, that was mostly developed by Terry Stewart and Jan Gossman. Um, it's called uh, Nango SPA. So SPA stands for Semantic Pointer Architecture. And this is another framework kind of in the same vein as the NEF, but even one level higher in the kind of conceptual space. So the idea here is to implement a vector symbolic architecture with the NEF, where the NEF itself is, developed, is uh, implemented with spiking neurons. So basically giving us a way to represent high level conceptual symbols with spiking neurons. So the basic idea behind SPA is that symbols or concepts are associated with a high dimensional vector, which we call a pointer or a semantic pointer. You can combine two pointers with superposition, which results in a pointer that is similar to both of the original pointers. So this addition is kind of similar to P1 and similar to P2. But you can also combine them with a, a binding operator, which we use circular, circular convolution, though it's not the only it's not the only one you could do, but it is basically an element-wise product. So as you've seen, it's uh, something that we've put a lot of thought into how to how to do well. Um, but you can take two pointers, you compute the circular convolution convolution of them, and you get a new pointer, which is not actually similar to either of the original pointers that you put in but can be used to recover the original pointers through an unbinding operation. So in this case, we'll take that pointer that we got out of the convolution of P1 and P2, P3, convolve it with a pseudo inverse of P1. And with that, we get back P2 plus some noise because this is a, a, a lossy operation. It's not, you're not gonna perfectly get back P2 um, but it essentially gives you a framework through which to build kind of higher level um, cognitive models that can be interrogated all the way down to the level of spiking neurons. Uh, you have a question, Fabrizio? Uh, yes, uh, this resembles a lot another Another framework which is uh, based on uh, single bits or uh, integer uh, quantities that, are, that it is called hyperdimensional computing. 
which is uh, the vector symbolic architectures, as you said before. So in this case, instead of having, uh, mm, let's say, normal quantities like integers and so on, the hyperdimensional vector would be made of spiking neurons, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's, and, uh, it's similar to that idea. Yep. Uh, Yes. Uh, in your research, did you find any differences in terms of performance uh, with respect to that or uh, something like that? Or do, did you do a comparison? Um, so for sure, when the SPA was kind of devised back in 2013, there was a, a you know lit review of the vector symbolic architectures that existed at the time. And the one that... Um, this VSA that was used uh, was the only one that seemed like it would actually scale to a human sized vocabulary. Uh, so you can look at the papers that were published around then to, um, to compare that because they do a comparison between uh, that VSA and other ones that were available at the time. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not intimately aware of the one that you're just talking about, whether or not that's, if that's a new one, it's possible that it could have a lot of the similar scaling properties that, uh, that Nango Spa uses, um, but uh, but yeah. So you'd have to, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure. That I don't. I'm not aware of anyone who's kind of gone back to the implementation of Spa to see if other architectures would be um, would be more efficient. I know that uh, Jan has implemented a second VSA within Nango Spa. Um, so kind of the, the data structures and things like that in Nango Spa, the networks could still be used with a different VSA and it still work. Perfect, thank you. Cool. Um, so when we originally developed Spa and integrated it with Nango, uh, we used it to make this kind of very high very high level, high dimensional model called Spawn. So this was uh, published in Science and it's is basically a full end-to-end -end spiking model where on the front end, we have a spiking vision system. We have some action selection mechanisms on the inside with kind of a simulated uh, basal ganglia thalamus system. And then on the motor side, we have a spiking network that is driving, in this case, a very simple two-link arm. But you know, since this is 2013, so even simulating this, which was simulated on the Java version, uh, was very computationally intensive and took hours to generate to generate you know milliseconds of si simulation. And so since then, we've you know done a bit of work extending this to other tasks. So um, I do encourage you to kind of watch these check out these videos because there's voiceover on them kind of explaining what the task is. But essentially they're doing cognitive tasks of like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a list of numbers. Okay, now tell me what was the third item in that list. And the, the goal of Spawn is to, to write that in this task. You can see it doing some like quote unquote thinking up here in these thought bubbles. Um, so yeah, uh, this is kind of our way of saying, you know, putting our kind of foot in the sand to say, you know, these methods that we've been talking about, the SPA, the NEF, these things are, you know, do work and can be scaled up super high to, to human level intelligent behavior. Um, we have updated Spawn to work on Nango 2.0. Uh, this, this is still a sped up video. It's not uh, I wouldn't say it's a fast simulation by any means because there's millions of neurons in it, but uh, it's still something that you can actually uh, simulate in our uh, Nango GUI. Um, moving on, another part of our front end ecosystem that is very recent actually, um, uh, Aaron Volker, kind of, I think in like a week or so, developed this uh, uh, project called Gyrus. And the idea of Gyrus is to make it even simpler, you know, in my opinion, the Nango syntax, the Nango API, because I mostly uh, kind of architected it, seems very simple. But you could make it even simpler by basically using NumPy syntax and under the hood translating that into Nango calls. 
So it's a project called Language Iris. So just as a quick kind of example of this, there are some things with Nango that are more difficult to do than others. Let's say you wanted to compute an outer product. So taking two vectors and rather than saying, you know, collapsing it down, that down to one dimension, blowing it up into all the possible permutations of that uh, product. If you wanted to do that in Nango, you could do that with this, uh, you know, nested for loop, run that simulation, do a bunch of probing, and you'd get your outer product. But in Gyrus, because it's kind of overloaded, or not overloaded, but it, it uses some classes that are aware, NumPy aware, you can take in your input u, say, oh, this is the stimulus that I'm using, that's my x, then give me the outer product of, of x, filter it with our my time constant tau, and then just run that, give me the array, and you can generate that outer product and just essentially three lines of, of Python. It's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> um, and it's a very new product or an, or a very, very new project. So I, I'm not really sure how many people have actually used it, but I wanted to highlight it because it is just pretty cool and interesting. The, uh, the models that you get out of it when you look at it in the GUI are, are quite uh, dense. So something interesting to play around with. Uh, just a few other things that I wanted to point out on the front end side is uh, we have a project called Nango Extras, which is where a lot of the things that people wanted to add to Nango Core but ended up not kind of fitting into it in an easy way where we put. So we have some extra learning rules, some extra neuron types, things like that going to Nango Extras. Nango Lib is a similar project by Aaron Volker. And then we have a repo that is just examples, just Nango examples in there. Uh, but I'll move on to the back end ecosystem. So uh, we kind of talked about this at the start of the talk, but what other backends do we have in Nango? How, what other platforms can you simulate Nango models on? Um, so Luigi is the one that we've uh, been using a lot in the past kind of decade. So Eric Hunsberger and I worked on this, well, primarily worked on this uh, Nango Luigi backend. Uh, in the ideal case, you know, if uh, you happen to have a simple model, all you need to do is change your nango.simulator call to nangaluihi.simulator, and then you've got a model that's working either on real hardware or on an emulator that is included with nangaluihi. So if you don't have access to Luihi hardware, you can still uh, pip install and try out this project. And what you'll be doing is kind of emulating uh, Luihi. I should say this is all for Luihi 1. We haven't updated it to work with Luihi 2. Um, but you know, this is a very uh, interesting project that we did in collaboration with Intel to basically show that using the, you know, existing library of models and networks that we've created in Nango and connecting that to a neuromorphic device like the Wihi, you're able to create these artificial intelligence models that do things. So, you know, just looking at this keyword spotting model that I showed earlier, it does the thing that you want, it, it does keyword spotting, but because we're doing it on Luihi, the accuracy um, diminishes a little bit. Actually, no, I think in this case, it actually improved, which is surprising, but in any case, it has good accuracy, uh, but it takes you know 110 times less power than if you were to run this on a traditional GPU. And we did this benchmarking across a, a bunch of different devices. Um, we're able to show that, yeah, Louis, he can, can uh, do this computation with very little dynamic energy cost. Similarly, that arm control model that I showed in Majoko, um, we were able to get it so that the control loop, so um, the amount of time that it takes for the Mujoko information to be processed by the simulation and then be communicated back to Majoko, that control loop is uh, faster on Luihi, um, taking about three-ish milliseconds, um, which is kind of similar to a small network running on the CPU, but not similar, you know, much better than a, a larger network running on a CPU. And uh, the Luihi can be kind of scaled up even further without having as large of a, of a cost in terms of speed. And of course, because this is normal for hardware, we can do this with much less power. So 
the uh, Loihi um, network, which is doing an adaptive motor control, is even more efficient than a very simple PID control network being implemented on a, on a CPU. And it has that adapt, adaption in it. Um, another piece of hardware that we worked with had a collaboration with a, with a group at the University of Manchester is Spinnaker. So um, again, in the ideal case, you just replace your nango.simulator call with nango.spinnaker.simulator, and then you can access that piece of hardware. Um, I don't have a great demo for this because uh, um, a lot of the work that we did on this was kind of 10 years ago, and um, Spinnaker itself has been updating their uh, hardware to new generations and is doing a lot of work on their side, and we haven't been able, had a chance to kind of go back to uh, and uh, develop a backend for that new device yet. Um, on the more um, general purpose side, uh, one of the first backends that we implemented along with the original release of Nango Core was Nango OCL, Nango OpenCL, developed by uh, James Bergstra and Eric Hunsberger. Um, and this uses the OpenCL computing framework to run Nango simulations. Um, at the time, it was significantly faster than the reference backend for some very large simulations. So this was a benchmark running, uh, looks like half a million neurons with 500 dimensions. And that was much faster on OpenCL than the reference backend. I think this is now a bit less dramatic of, a, of an improvement going to OpenCL, but it's still the case that if you have an AMD GPU, I think this is your only route forward to running Nango uh, models on your GPU because since then we've been focusing on TensorFlow uh, backends, which are uh, only work on NVIDIA GPUs. But I, I'm pretty sure this backend still works and people still use it for uh, accelerating their simulations. And I sort of went, sort of mentioned these before, but there are some other backends like Nango FPGA, Nango Braindrop. Nango MPI in various states of kind of <clears throat> maintenance and things like that. But uh, you know, these are things to look at if you're interested in these spaces to see what the state of those projects are. Um, then there are some other parts of the ecosystem that span more than just the front end and back end. So the Nango GUI that I've shown a lot already does that. You can you can run your simulation on different backends by passing a command line argument to the Nango GUI. Um, and it's mostly developed by Terry, and I did a bit of it. Um, but the, just in case you're curious about the kind of technology stack that this runs off of, there's a Python web server that's actually running the simulations and doing all of that web servery stuff. And then the client itself is, is really written with raw HTML and JavaScript without much in terms of libraries, except for d3.js, which is a plotting library. And it makes liberal use of web sockets in order to get information quickly from the uh, Python web server to the client. There have been a bunch of efforts in the past, you know, 10, five years to modernize the Nango GUI, but, uh, but none of those have been publicly released yet. I'll say that. And then the last project that I want to, that I want to highlight has probably been the one that we've ended up using the most since uh, Daniel Rasmussen made it. Uh, it's called Nango DL and Nango DL is, uh, a kind of host of tools that exposes Nango and makes Nango work with TensorFlow under the hood. So in the simplest form, if you just use Nango DL for its simulator, for its backend, you know, you replace Nango.simulator with Nango DL.simulator, what you'll see is your simulations run much faster, especially if you have your, you know, GPU exposed to TensorFlow. So, you know, if it was just this, this would be a super cool project and a big win. But in actuality, Nango DL does even more. So I, I mentioned before the, the NEF as a way of kind of engineering these networks uh, that are transmitting vectors from you know, one ensemble to another. But the thing that it can't do is solve those optimization pro problems across multiple layers of neurons, which is you know, what kind of artificial neural networks, deep neural networks nowadays 
basically only do. Um, so in NingoDL, instead of using those built-in solvers, it will solve, it will um, basically use the TensorFlow optimizers to do these things. And so instead of just training the connection between layer one and layer two, what NangoDL lets you do is say, this is where I'm gonna feed in inputs and these are where I'm gonna get my outputs and everything that happens inside there, any trainable parameter in there, make it exposed to, to TensorFlow such that you can train on it. And the way that this looks is, is actually relatively simple if you have your model in, uh, in Nango is you, uh, you know, just produce your model as normal, create your simulator um, with the Nango DL simulator, and then you can call train and it will, you know, solve all, all do all those optimizations for you. Uh, and that means it can train, in addition to the weights, it can train biases, um, other types of uh, constants within the network. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this, then I would uh, encourage you to check out these two examples, one of which embeds a full Keras model inside an Ingo model with TensorNode. And this one, which is kind of a new feature that we added, was to take a Keras model and convert it to native Nengo objects, um, which makes it a much more straightforward process to make it spiking. Um, and so this example goes through a full example where it takes that model, makes it a spiking neural network, and then also goes through the uh, difficult work of making that spiking neural network have similar performance as the uh, non-spiking artificial neural network. Um, so that's all the, those are all the projects that I wanted to show you. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about in terms of kind of the Nego ecosystem is the uh, you know non-code aspects of it. You know what uh, what kind of community there is for Nengo. Um, so one thing I want to highlight is that we have a I would say relatively active forum. So if you are interested in trying out Nengo, you go to the Nengo website website Nengo.ai. You know if there's some issues with the installation or you install it but you run some tutorial and it wasn't what you expected, then I would for sure encourage you to come to the Nango forum um, and ask about those kinds of things or look at whether what other people are posting because we encourage people to uh, kind of post their networks on the forum. Uh, and then another thing that uh, we obviously stopped doing for COVID reasons, but are, are now back to our Nango summer schools. So this is done through uh, Chris Elias Miss Lab at the University of Waterloo, um, but we've been doing it since, uh, I guess 2014, is that right? Yeah, this was the first uh, summer school or brain camp. And we kind of have a bunch of, uh, you know, videos for each of the summer schools that we've done that are kind of fun, you can check those out. Uh, but essentially it's a week, uh, two week long program where the first week um, there's a bunch of Nango tutorials taught by Nango developers and then people in Chris's lab. And then the second week is really dedicated to doing a project with Nango. And we'll have neuromorphic hardware available at the summer school. So if you are really wanting to get your hands on a Loihi, I'm not sure if Loihi will be available, but Spinnaker maybe. There'll be some kinds of devices that you can you can play with at the summer school. Uh, look at look at our website, the nango.ai slash summer school for more details and uh, applications for this upcoming June's summer school are currently open until March. So. I would encourage you to apply if you're interested in uh, learning more. Um, one thing that I just wanted to uh, make sure is explicit before I, you know, end the talk is, uh, you know, this community, the open neuromorphic community is uh, dedicated to um, open source neuromorphic computing. But I do want to just be explicit that uh, uh, Nango Core, Nango Core's source itself, while it is public, is not technically licensed under an open source license. We have our own proprietary license that we uh, basically say any non commercial use, you know, we want you to use Nango for anything. You can, you know, make your own um, forks, you can do all that kind of stuff, you can contribute um, things back to us if you have contributions you want us to include in Nango. We're super open to that, you know, it's a, it's at its core a research tool or rather it's kind of origins are in research. So we don't, we never want to kind of cut off the neuromorphic research community. 
but this is still something that we are using in a commercial basis. So we, um, when we contract with commercial clients, then we do have commercial licenses that we have them purchase through ABR. So I just wanted to be explicit about that before I finish, uh, which I'll do now. So thanks a lot again, Gregor and Fabrizio for the invitation. And uh, if anyone has any more questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer. I, I will start off with, I have a couple of questions, but uh, yeah, I will start off with one maybe um, until other people also ask something. Um, so if, what would you say to people coming from uh, the classical deep learning uh, frameworks? Like, uh, I mean, certainly me, I got in touch with uh, neural networks through the deep learning revolution. What would you say to these people that they can do with the neural engineering framework that they would maybe not be able to do um, by using, you know, uh, your gradient-based optimization? Um, what what uh, what would you say? Maybe uh, would you say there's like differences of applications, or what are some of the differences there? Yeah. So, so you know, I think the reason why we've you know gone from gone through such lengths to incorporate deep learning models alongside NEF type models is because they're basically good for different things. So I think there's a both super useful, super, um, I would say necessary tools to building things that actually work. You know, like I said, the original goal of Nango was to make functional models. And there are some cases where you can easily write kind of logic. Um, you can engineer a network to do a thing. So you can say, you know, if, uh, if I'm giving some fear signal to this network, then I want it to inhibit these neurons. Um, or, you know, I know that, um, you know, in order to drive this motor, I need to compute this Jacobian matrix. That's something that if you're able to write an equation for it, then the NEF is a super good way of quickly getting that pre-existing knowledge into a neural network. Not to say that you can't use deep learning to do those things, but there are definitely problems that are like way more suited to deep learning approaches, statistical kind of problems, you know, image classification, audio uh, classification. Um, basically mm -hmm. the, the idea I would say is like, the, yeah, the ideal scenario is that you're engineering the parts of the, the network that you can engineer and then learning the parts of the network that you, know, you can't write an equation for. Would you say that, uh, for example, the NEF is, is more suitable to clo for closed loop uh, systems, like uh, anything that's, that has to do with control or like in robotics applications or something like that, where you cannot optimize for like end to end maybe or? Yeah, for sure. Like it's certainly, that's what we've been using it for. Uh, primarily because it is such so good in closed loop environments. And also, you know, I didn't really talk at all in, in this presentation about the online learning, but uh, that's, you know, another thing that, you know, traditional deep learning approaches don't uh, kind of support natively. They're designed to work in kind of a training regime and then an inference regime. So you do your training offline and hopefully you've gotten all of the data that you need such that in inference time you do well. Uh, but there are some um, applications, and so in control is especially an important one where, you know, you have a drone that's flying. If it's flying outside, there's wind, and that wind is going to change over time. And so um, the NEF gives us a way of accounting for that, for the forces of wind through online learning that, uh, you know, not saying that there aren't approaches that you could do that are more kind of traditional deep learning based, but... Uh, Basically, our, uh, we've gotten ours to work. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question by Said. Uh, there are many approaches to neuromorphic computing, like Nango, for example, how to start and implement it in uh, a specific or intended hardware. So I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a good question because um, like as far as where to start, Like, 
yeah, like, you know, the, the, the easiest way to start, in my opinion, is to just do a bunch of examples. So starting with, um, you know, you do a bit of a scan of the neuromorphic computing systems that are available. Um, most of them have some kind of introductory tutorial or example. You can either look through it, but I really think it's much more helpful to actually install the tool and run through the tutorial yourself. Um, because it gives you a feel for what it's like, actually like to use it, which is often very diff different from, you know, what these demos and things like that show. Um, so basically whenever I'm approaching a new field like that, that's what I do is I, I run through the tutorials of a bunch of different um, projects that seem like they would be interesting. Um, but at a certain point, you're just gonna have to choose one and, uh, you know, figure out how you're going to solve the problem that you're looking at. If you have an intended hardware platform that you're aiming toward, then your space of what kind of systems you're looking at are gonna be constrained by what things will support that kind of hardware. So if you're gonna start working on a Loihi model your options right now are basically Lava and Snega Luihi. Um, and, you know, I'd encourage you to go through the introductory tutorials for both to see, uh, to see which makes the most sense to you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I have another question if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so I think one thing about neuromorphics, at least from, from my point of view, is that uh, uh, advantages if you have the whole pipeline let's say of a sensor and algorithms and hardware then um, you know you might get some some good benefits um but what i find interesting is that actually th these days uh, neuromorphic hardware is not really commercially available or um, most of them is research chips yet uh, abr um, sells commercial licenses of its um, uh, software so would you say that um Nango or the neural engineering framework on its own uh, is strong enough to like compete against uh, you know solutions that are some more classical solutions that are out there even without the hardware because to my understanding at least they are not commercially available. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good uh, that's a good question, good point, uh, and you know the uh, my. Uh, the, the business side of ABR would like me to, you know, highlight that uh, ABR is in the process of producing our own hardware. Unfortunately, it is more of a AI accelerator and not a kind of traditional neuromorphic chip. Um, but yeah, the, know, the short answer. Can you share, can you share the name sorry? of this uh, uh, ch uh, hardware, or is this? Uh, yeah, the, oh, um, if you go to the um, Applied Brain Research website, AppliedBrainResearch.com. Uh, we just revamped the website to highlight these chips. Um, so they're called TSPs, time series mm -hmm. processors. Um, and yeah, they, they, they leverage a, an algorithm that I haven't talked much about in this presentation called the LMU, which is a time series um, uh, algorithm, kind of a alternative to LSTMs that have a lot of uh, favorable properties that we've, I think a large portion of the um, networks that I showed in the demo in some way use LMUs to do, um, to handle these time series problems more effectively than uh, LSTMs and other like transformers and things like that. But, uh, but yeah, as far as like whether or not Nango itself could like compete, you know, I'm, I'm under no delusion that, uh, that Nango would ever be able to like um, be a, seen as a viable alternative to something like TensorFlow or PyTorch in part because like, we just don't have the resources that you would need to do something like that. Um, whether or not, like, I think if you're interested in like the idea of neuromorphic computing, even without hardware, Nengo is, I would say, a very attractive development environment to build models that, you know, you can use to do research, that you can use to compare to experimental results to say, you know, if we make this model with these assumptions, then um, 
then you can look at the spiking activity and it matches these brain areas. If you look at the publications on, uh, on uh, the computational neuroscience at the University of Waterloo, their website, yeah, just a lot of those publications are, are these types of uh, research problems. Nice, thank you. Um, there's another question by Said. Uh, suppose I want to start with Loi hardware, supposedly with Nango, where, mm -hmm. where would they start with? Yeah, so if you go to the uh, Nango Luigi website, nango.ai slash Nango Luigi, um, you can get started um, because if you install Nango Luigi, you get a Luigi emulator with it. So it'll give you a platform to start playing around with it without having to uh, engage with Intel. Um, of course, if you're gonna, if you're serious about using Luigi, then you do need to uh, contact the uh, INRC, the Intel Neuromorphic Research something uh, community. <laughs> community, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if you send an email, they have a, an email address you can email, uh, and they'll talk to you about getting access to uh, Luigi hardware. Um, and in the meantime, you can you can use the Nango Luigi emulator. And then if you do get access to Luigi hardware, then moving your model from software to hardware is just a matter of uh, setting a different flag. Uh, that's true of Luigi 1. Of course, if you're talking to the INRC, then most likely you're going to want to start learning about Luigi 2, uh, in which case, yeah, I would start going through the lab of tutorials while you're waiting for access. Does, um, for people who get started in this field or who are thinking about starting a PhD or does ABR offer any kind of internships for people? Um, the, do you, I assume you work because Chris uh, is still at the uh, University of Waterloo, I assume, do, do, they, do you take new students or? Um... Um, unfortunately, ABR, I would say is still kind of in the startup scale up stage. So we don't have uh, the resources to really take on um, PhD students or interns or anything like that. So um, so at the moment, the uh, summer school is the main way that uh, ABR is trying to, you know, support people new to the field who are interested in trying Nango. Um, as far as, you know, doing a PhD with Chris Eli Smith or uh, Brian Tripp is also a professor at the University of Waterloo. Um, you know, a lot of the people that have gone through Chris's lab have their own labs now that you can contact and see if they're open to uh, new students. There's also a lot of people who kind of like went to the summer school previously that are, that are now working um, in their own labs that use Nango or, you know, similar tools that uh, could have uh, an interesting research program. So um, yeah, I don't have anything specific to say other than, uh, you know, search oh, people's uh, yeah research profiles with Nango and uh, totally there's more sense. than there used to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's two more questions. Um, one, is this summer uh, school that you mentioned uh, available for people who should learn AI from scratch uh, or do you have to have some um, basic knowledge, some requirements about neuromorphic uh, computing? Uh, yeah, it's it's open to anyone. Um, you know, there's a, I think we recommend that you have some kind of familiarity with programming and Python in general, but I would say running through a few like introductory Python tutorials and courses, like if you do a, you know, Coursera or Udacity course that uses Python, you should be good. You don't need any uh, AI knowledge beforehand. Um, I believe in the application, we ask you to propose a project and it's the uh, project proposal that I think is a large driver of, of uh, whether or not you are accepted to the summer, summer school. So um, I would say I would spend more time thinking about, you know, what kind of problem you would want to solve with a neuromorphic uh, computing system. Thank you. And then there's another one about uh, Loihi, uh, about implementing Loihi. Um, 
supposedly on uh, open source FPGA. Could this be done trying to mimic the interloy on an FPGA? Um, like it depends to what granularity you want to mimic it. I believe there are details about Loihi that are, you know, proprietary and not accessible to uh, anyone, but those working in the, in Intel. So I, I don't think you would be able to get a bit accurate, you know, this is exactly what Luigi is doing, but on an FPGA, but you could certainly emulate kind of the behavior of it. Um, uh, I would say, you know, mostly I'd, I'd be kind of curious as to your motivation to do so. If, if your goal is to use FPGAs to implement a neuromorphic system, I would say you don't necessarily need to emulate Loihi to do that. There's other open source um, solutions that I'm sure will be talked about in this group that uh, I would say are probably a better target. Not because there's anything wrong with Loihi, Loihi just because it will be less effort. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. So if there's, I think, um, there's no more questions, then I would like to thank Trevor uh, a lot for this very interesting talk. It's really cool that like you have like YouTube videos for all your projects. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's really good. It's always good to showcase uh, what you what you can do. Um, as I, as, we, as I said in the beginning, this talk talk is going to be uploaded to, to YouTube. And um, yeah, then you will be able to post the link in the events page. Great. Thanks again, thanks again for the opportunity. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Trevor. Bye-bye.